Brian Bonner, Chief Editor of the Kiev Post, coming to you live with the latest Kiev Post webinar. We have a great topic today, great experts. The topic is Ukraine's infrastructure needs. I'll cut to the uh, little spoiler, they're enormous. And uh, the other part of the title is what's the cost? Cut to the chase, enormous. But within that we have a lot to discuss and we're doing it live from the Kiev Post studio in the Kador building, 68 Zelanska Street. So I'm going to start by letting the speakers, starting with uh, uh, nearest me, uh, just introduce yourself and then we'll get the discussion rolling. Thanks, Brian. Uh, I'm Oru Banerjee. I'm the World Bank's uh, regional country director uh, for Eastern Europe, um, based here in Kiev, but overseeing uh, Ukraine, Belarus and Moldova. Thank you. Uh, I'm Salat Yelaiko, Deputy Head of State Property Fund, in charge of privatization and all processes concerned with privatization. Thank you, Brian. My name is Dmitro Martinenko. I'm a manager partner at um, Quarter Partners Investment Company, which uh, uh, invests in infrastructure projects as well. So I'm, uh, I hope that our discussion will be productive today. My name is Yuri Vaskov. I am deputy of the Minister of Infrastructure of Ukraine. And I'm just thrilled that we're all in studio in the, in the age of webinar, online webinars and hybrid events. Uh, but it's, it's great that we're here uh, just defining, and I, I want to thank Quarter Partners uh, uh, actually for start r straight up for sponsoring this and making this, this event happen. There's a lot to discuss here, and obviously the polls show, depending on which pieces of the infrastructure, it's fair to say Ukrainians aren't completely satisfied. That might be the mild way to put it. Uh, we can define infrastructure as broadly or as narrowly, but I guess for the purpose of this discussion, we'll talk about roads, railways, ports, uh, public transport, uh, air travel. I mean, you could conceivably go into electricity if you want and the, the grid network, you could talk sewers, you could talk all day on this. But I wanted to start out um, because we've seen so many studies and we've seen so much interest that, to get sort of the assessment of what you think is the state of, of Ukraine's infrastructure in the parts that you feel most comfortable talking about. and. We read and publish so many studies showing 60 billion is needed here. President Volodymyr Zelensky went to Washington and presented a $277 billion infrastructure plan. So this number, that number, it's hard to know what is the real plan and, and where you think um, you know, the priority should be and, and how it's going to be financed. So I'll let you start. You start with the easy question. Yeah, the easy right, one. Right, thanks. And thanks a lot. Look, um, for Ukraine, uh, you know, for the World Bank, one of the things that we are most interested in is, is of course, uh, Ukraine's growth and the welfare and prosperity of its people. And for that, infrastructure actually is critical. Ukraine is clearly, there's a huge infrastructure gap. You know, I can throw numbers around, but that's not useful. What is useful to understand is that Ukraine, obviously, as all of us know, is underinvesting tremendously in infrastructure. Um, just some numbers, you talked about numbers. So Ukraine, just overall public investment in Ukraine is about 16% uh, of GDP, 16.5% of GDP over the last decade. You know what Sub-Saharan Africa invests, a typical Sub-Saharan African country? 21% of GDP, wow. right? So if you are investing so little in public investment, um, how will the growth happen? So I think part of the, the impetus that we need to have is not just because, yes, yeah, sure, we need to get from point A to point B, but also because this is fundamental to Ukraine's future prospects, to get the infrastructure right and to invest adequately and efficiently in infrastructure. I'll hand over to my colleagues, but I would like to come back later to talk about what investing in infrastructure means. And it's not just building new roads or building new ports, um, bu building new rail lines. It's also maintaining it, mm -hmm. right? So investing in infrastructure, the infrastructure needs, 
are not just about the new, flashy, shiny things. It's also about protecting and preserving what we have already. Okay. So, I mean, key is that 16% of GDP, it's, it's not enough. No. Nope. What, what is, there, is there a benchmark that the World Bank suggests? There isn't a benchmark um, for public investment, um, but clearly the competitors tell the story. In Europe, overall, you have countries essentially investing in the 20% range. 20 this is to public investment or a combination? Public investment. Public investment. Or Private or investment, if you add that on, it's maybe uh, double that or more. Okay. In, if you, again, numbers are numbers, but our assessment says that um, essentially in these particular types of infrastructure that you're talking about, um, Ukraine needs about 10 to $12 billion a year. Uh, minimum. And of that, the government can only spend about one and a half billion, something of that, that order. So that's a gap where private investors have to come in and fill that gap. Okay. We'll get to private investment soon because we're not exactly swimming in private investment here. But l let me go to Terras of, of the uh, State Property Fund, which is in the, all the years I've been here, many years in Ukraine, the State Property Fund is now the most active I've ever seen it. Uh, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, 1,500 auctions this year, bringing in 83 million. I think everybody knows the, the history, the post-Soviet history from then to now. We still own a, the state government still owns a lot of businesses and a lot of them are not managed well and a lot of them are losing a lot of money and a lot of them are big sources of corruption. Can you tell me where the State Property Fund fits into this infrastructure question? Um, thank you, Brian. And it's really an interesting question because uh, in Ukraine we still have a huge amount of state property. For, your ex for example, uh, state still manages more than 3,600 enterprises. It's a huge amount. And frankly speaking, for the state purpose, is needed like uh, we estimated like six, uh, seven hundred. All others should be sold and attract the private investments. So the state property fund right now is uh, moving towards the privatization, and we really conduct a huge amount of auctions. It's really even more than uh, fifteen hundred auctions per year. Uh, this year we believe we will conduct uh, roughly two thousand auctions. And the key question is really not simply to sell the assets because. As representative of uh, United, Na United Nations uh, told us, your task is not just to get the highest price. Your task is to transfer the assets from not very efficient owner to efficient owners with and attract investments. And that's the point. So uh, this year, I believe we will uh, assure the proceeds from privatization above 10 billion hryvnias. So it's our task. And what we see, uh, that for every revenue that we get from privatization, the investments that is planned in uh, these assets are roughly from four to six revenues. So it's a huge amount of additional investments. And if you are talking about infrastructure, so uh, this year we will have for the first time the privatization of small regional seaports. So the state property fund uh, right now is working on uh, moving to privatization this report, the decision was taken by the uh, Ministry of Infrastructure in uh, 2019 and uh, we were preparing these seaports for privatization and uh, this month, in, I believe in a week, we will announce the first auction for privatization of small regional seaport and I believe uh, it will be very interesting event because we will see how the investors will behave because we are not talking here about uh, the concession. We are talking here about, you know, selling 100% of shares of, this, of these ports and we will see the demand for such uh, interesting investments. And as we feel, we will have a huge uh, competition through the auction because we've got the request like from different uh, part of the world and not only Ukrainian investors are interested in these projects. And if we will be successful, I hope that together with the Ministry of Infrastructure we will go forward. Uh, after this project with the first three seaports and uh, we will attract more investments. So the next three big things to watch are privatization of three seaports. 
Yes. Which ones? Uh, we are talking about Uzdunaisk. It will be the first seaport moved for privatization to privatization. After that, Bilhorodnistrovsk and Skadovsk. Unfortunately, when we are talking about, you know, efficient and efficient owner, when we've got these three seaports and the situation is the same with like most of the state property. Uh, we will not see the brilliant, you know, enterprises that are efficient, very operational efficient with a huge amount of turnover. We will see mostly semi-abandoned building. We will see a huge amount of debts. We will see frozen assets and frozen mainly by uh, tax authorities because unfortunately these enterprises are not paying even uh, land taxes. They have uh, usually a huge amount of land, you know, uh, beneath the buildings, but they are not able even to pay the land taxes. And it's, it's weird a little bit when the seaport is like staying, uh, one or two employees are going around and, you know, looking only uh, that nobody would steal anything. It shouldn't be like that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, when you see the demand, when economic uh, in the regions need, you know, these ports in order to transfer their goods and, you know, uh, uh, like fertilizers, uh, wood and so on and so forth. And these ports are not operational because of, uh, you know, unfortunately. So I believe that we will succeed. But these are project. smaller ports. Yes. We have really five big ports and actually yes. one big one. And they're, they're all publicly owned yes. still. What were the two uh, with concessions? Uh, and and is it, has there been enough time to assess how that's working yet? Uh, I think that it's a question uh, mainly directed to Yuri with concessions. Okay. Uh, but uh, we will see the state, as, as of now, the state understands that, okay, with big seaports, we need, uh, we can't lose the government control in any way. But with small regional port, we will make this like a uh, trial. We will see the results. And after that, we will decide what we should do with, with you know, a huge amount of other small regional seaports, uh, sea and river seaports. Uh, because the concession, I, I'm not very sure that they will be interesting for concessionaires. Uh -huh. Because, you know, when the amount of investments is like estimated in $5 million, I'm not very sure that it will be interesting for concessionaires. But for private ownerships, uh, for private average size investments, it can be very attractive. And the uh, final thing uh, before we, we move on, with the items that have been sold, uh, is the state property fund happy with uh, the interest from private investors and the price? Yes, uh, because the auctions are very transparent. Everybody knows, frankly, now, when you are buying something from the state, you will uh, find the same situation when you buy something on the private market. So, uh, right now, we really changed during the last two years the privatization process. And you will meet with the same procedures, with the same approach that you will meet uh, do when you are doing a classic uh, M&A deal on private market. The only difference is that uh, in private M&A deal, you will uh, agree the price with somebody in the state, in case of state, you will uh, have to participate in the auction. And it's the only difference. We have the same, you know, uh, teasers for every object in English and Ukrainian. We have the same virtual data rooms with all initial documentation, which allows the investor to conduct, you know, the due diligence from any point of the world. Simply sign in one time and day and you will get access to all documents uh, from all state-owned enterprises that are moved to privatization. So for average enterprise, for example, we are uploading uh, roughly from 1,000 to 3,000 initial documents. Mm -hmm. So you, you can see everything, okay. you know, and uh, we see the results. Uh, even with some infrastructure, let, let's call them projects like uh, Kiev Pass uh, Service. It was the operator of a uh, bus network of bus station in Kiev and uh, Kiev region. So uh, the situation was really weird. So the profit was zero and even slightly negative. The uh, situation with the bus station, and I believe that people uh, that used to live in Kiev uh, are familiar with the central uh, bus station in Kiev. It was dramatic because, you know, uh, it was even, you know, disgusted uh, to enter these uh, premises, right. you know. And right now, after privatization, we have, uh, okay, one and a half year ago, it was privatized. 
you know, the new owners totally uh, made the total reconstruction of uh, central bus station in Kyiv. So right now it's very pretty bus station with uh, lounge zone, with small hotel, with uh, food courts, you know, with internet. You can't find anything like that, uh, like uh, two, two years ago. They developed the uh, IT solution for uh, bus operators, how to sell the tickets. Right now they attracted, uh, some. as I know, they attracted three new uh, bus operators to the central uh, bus station and you know and that's the result the total amount of investments only into this central bus station was above uh, 100 million hryvnias in one year after privatization so that's the result that we are aiming in through privatization and i believe that we will see the situation very similar with all these regional seaports in the nearest future okay that's a great overview uh dimitra uh it's what is your perspective of the most critical needs? And uh, as Dr. Banerjee said, uh, you know, 10 to $12 billion a year in investment, small economy we still have in Ukraine, $150 billion GDP, $60 billion, not going to all come from the private sector. And we all know that uh, uh, private investors have not exactly been flocking to invest in Ukraine for numerous reasons, mostly related to rule of law and protection of property rights. Given that landscape and the fact that the new investment needs to be green investment too, uh, how do you sketch me out your vision for the short term? Yeah, thank you, Brian. Um, you're absolutely right. So um, what investors normally required uh, are pretty well known. First of all, this is the rule of law. So we, we need to understand what are the rules. And the rules are, should be transparent, equal, uh, etc. So we, we, we know that uh, this is uh, not a new problem uh, in Ukraine. However, we uh, see um, new investment opportunities. Yeah, um, We are Mm, uh, we see that, for instance, um, a new law on concessions was enacted um, just before the pandemic, right? And uh, it gives new instruments for investors. One of the um, uh, one of the innovations is the initiation of the concession can be done by a private investor, which is not available in the past. Because the first law on concessions was enacted back in 1999, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was, uh, uh, that time, it was uh, only the, the power of the state to initiate some concession tenders and etc. So now the initiative uh, goes to private investors as well. Yeah. So um, uh, the, uh, the problem is, to understand what uh, infrastructure, uh, uh, what exact infrastructure Ukraine needs for the current days and what is important for the future, right? Because we, we understand that uh, this is a very broad topic, yeah? From ports and airports to the, uh, to the gas supply and, uh, uh, and uh, renewables as well, right? So uh, for the last decade, for instance, uh, the government um, uh, stimulated private investors to invest into renewables, in solar, in wind station, etc. So uh, it is very important uh, for investors to understand uh, uh, the, the, the rule of the game and uh, uh, that the regulatory regime should be predictable, right? So we are not talking about the, the rates of the green tariff or, or some interest rate. It is important. However, in terms of the uh, uh, predictability, in terms of the stability, and uh, in terms of the sustainability of the business models, because we think about uh, on the business models and we are interested that the business models, uh, whatever we invest in airports or ports, 
should be sustainable. And we see not only for one or two years, but uh, uh, at least uh, for a decade, right? Uh, to understand what should be, uh, what, what the market di dictates, what, uh, uh, what the um, attitude of the, uh, of the state to the, to, the, to the projects. So uh, it's all about that, it's all about that. What, um, can you explain uh, exactly what a concession is? It's between, it, it doesn't change ownership, but it, cha it changes the management and investment requirements of whatever yeah. the property is. Yeah. So why is that advantageous over just selling something? Yeah, it is, it is very simple. Um, I will give you an example in aviation industry. So in our portfolio, we manage, we operate the second largest airport in Ukraine, which is Kyiv International Korsky. Airport, named uh, uh, after Igor Sikorsky, right? And uh, um, uh, for, the, for, the, for the last uh, um, seven or eight years, every year, uh, we participated in the um, Global Airport Development Conference, which is worldwide where all the, uh, all the um, airports uh, from uh, whatever uh, parts of the world uh, come together to discuss the, the actual issues. So uh, concession is a very known and understandable instrument. And you're absolutely right. That instrument allows to keep the ownership uh, uh, on side of the municipality or the state, but on the other term, uh, concession means that the asset transfer on the balance sheet of the concessioner, and concessioner may use it as a financial leverage to attract investments, right? Uh, and it is uh, um, uh, extremely important, for instance, uh, in the aviation industry. Because uh, uh, if you need to, to develop the modern infrastructure, new terminals, new aprons, new taxiways, uh, you need financing. And uh, uh, unless you have it in, in the concession, it is almost impossible to attract uh, uh, financing for that, yeah? for, to, to build that infrastructure. So it's extremely important to, to, be, uh, to have it in place. So I hope that uh, this new instrument uh, 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 of the of the concessions will help Ukraine to go to to an upper level. So Sikorsky is still state owned. Uh, it is uh, uh, the the aerodrome part, which is uh, the runway, uh, aprons and uh, taxiways uh, uh, belong to municipality, not the state, but uh, but uh, municipality. However, the the terminals, the new infrastructure. Uh, was built by us, yeah, and uh, we face now that we need to uh, extend the runway in order to accommodate the larger aircrafts, mm -hmm. because uh, uh, our clients, the airlines, they change their fleet, mm -hmm. right, to to have it more efficient, more uh, more modern, uh, etc. So we need to be in line with the needs of our clients. So that's why uh, it is so important for us. So you have ownership in? Yeah, we have ownership in terms of the terminals, terminals. Uh, uh, new terminals that we built, uh, uh, some other infrastructure. But uh, this business, uh, um, of course, uh, can be done without the runway, without the, the aprons, the taxiways. Right. And uh, uh, it requires a lot of investments, a lot. So, so it's, it, it's um, you know, a million and million dollars. In a nation with a budget of only $50 billion, this is, concessions are going to be more important in the future in terms of attracting investment, do you think? Private investment? Or more used? Uh, well, um, uh, again, um, there are two ways. If, uh, if the state uh, is able to accommodate such big amounts and invest in TIG, that, that, that's good. Even in that case, there's possible a combination of uh, private and public partnership. Right. And actually, concession is one of the form of right. the PPPs, so-called, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, however, in, in case of Ukraine, so we understand that uh, there is a lack of financing. 
yeah, uh, because of different reasons, we understand. So the, the task, the state task, uh, I think, is to create such environment, investment environment, regulatory environment, uh, environment to encourage private business invest into in, uh, infrastructure, right? So, and uh, the, uh, uh, the steps that I mentioned, uh, of course, uh, uh, support that, that idea. However, uh, there, there are still a lot of uh, problems, I would say, on, uh, on, that, uh, uh, on that way. Uh, so we hope that uh, uh, even today we, we could discuss how to overcome these barriers, how to create these conditions. So, oh, we, sh we shall. Uh, I think that's the key. Uh, to this, I wanted to, to get before I moved on to Yuri with the infrastructure ministry. Uh, your assessment: what, where do you think? Pri boy, let me put it this way: the the parts of the infrastructure that are in the worst shape versus the best shape, and the parts that are the most attractive to investors versus least, and they may be different. I mean, investors may be attracted to the worst parts of the infrastructure. I don't know. How do you? generally view the state of infrastructure here and, it, and its investment attractiveness. I mean, in terms of the different sectors from railways to roads to airports to seaports. It's a big question. What? Uh, uh, well. Are, are you mainly involved in air, air, airports? Well, we mainly, of course, involved in the, right. in the, in the aviation industry. Uh, however, um, uh, this is a good question. How to allocate the funds correctly? Yeah, which industry or, or area uh, uh, to support yeah, from, the, from the state side? Uh, this is largely depend uh, of um, how we see the role and place of Ukraine uh, in the in the world, yeah, I would see, on the regional level, yeah, on the uh, continental level in Europe, for instance, and uh, in the world, yeah. So, what role uh, are we going to play in uh, uh, in the current and future economics, right? And of course, uh, needless to say, that uh, uh, probably. One of the biggest uh, Ukraine advantages is location. So we are a neighbor of the one of the richest and uh, um, markets in the world, which is European Union, right? So uh, that's why uh, I believe uh, we need to develop the infrastructure uh, in uh, in terms of. Um, on the uh, roads and motorways to to Europe. Uh, ports infrastructure, uh, airports, right? Uh, and then, uh, and al uh, then also, um, if we are talking about uh, in light of the European Green Deal passed recently, right? So uh, Ukraine uh, is considered as uh, one of the countries that may be uh, the supplier of um, a green energy. Uh, like uh, hy hydrogen, for instance. So uh, the question, how are we going to deliver a new uh, a green energy to European Union? So we need, uh, we need the infrastructure. Yeah? So technical guys will tell us w what uh, uh, should be done on the technical level, whether it should be by uh, pipes or, or some, somehow, can we use the, uh, mm, uh, the facilities uh, of the, of the naftogas now or not, right? And depending on that, uh, we, we uh, should focus uh, uh, on the most, uh, um, most important, most prominent uh, uh, sectors that uh, could uh, help Ukraine to jump uh, on the other level and uh, take uh, uh, an adequate place in the world's economy and uh, regional economy as well. So that's my answer. Okay. Let's move to the Ministry of Planes, Trains, Automobiles, and I believe still the Postal Service, right? They have it all. But it's no secret, Yuri, that uh, 
Ukraine inherited when it was a newly independent nation an aging infrastructure, but the president has big ambitions. Some of them, by 2024, high-speed trains, we don't have any now, intercity trains to all 24 oblast capitals, 25 new industrial parks, 10 functioning regional airports, and a national airline. I want to get your opinion on that because that seems to fly in the face of OECD guidelines on what should be state-owned and what should not be state-owned. Do we really need a state-owned airline? And also the transfer of all ports, as we talked about, on a concession or privatization basis. Um, that's a lot to do. Uh, it, it, does the Ministry of Infrastructure have a strategy to get there? Yes, we have a strategy and uh, we are implementing the strategy. I would like to start from the ports, if possible, sure. as uh, previous speakers <coughs> already mentioned. First of all, we uh, fully appreciate present position of a state property fund uh, in the field of privatization. Uh, we, our strategy that the state in the future should be responsible only for strategic assets like harbor, so channels, and maximum some bursts and some hydrotechnics uh, assets. Uh, all the hinterland, stevedoring companies, terminals, some machinery, warehouses, etc., should be uh, moved to the private sector through the way of privatization, concession, or lease, like rent agreement. So we uh, foresee all forms of uh, PPP activity, uh, because uh, particular form depends on the particular terminal or mm -hmm. ports. Uh, I would like to remind you that um, we have 13 state stevedoring companies, or we can call them ports, but ports, according to legislation, is a geographical object. Uh, Taras said about privatization of three ports. Uh, it's, uh, on the practice, it's three cargo terminals, mm -hmm. which situated in the port hub. Uh, <coughs> we fully support it, and we hope that until the end of this year, so maybe some tenders will start it. Uh, also this year, we, we, would, we hope that in December, we will finish with two pilot projects for concession, Port of Kherson and uh, Port of Olvia. Started uh, more than three years ago, it's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, the difference between concession and privatization, um, we see that uh, for, for small, small terminals like Skadovsk, Velgranisrovsk and Uzdunaisk, privatization is a good pilot project because small ports and not so huge amount of, uh, uh, of expenses uh, potential uh, investors should uh, spend at one, uh, after tender. If you are talking about middle or big ports, a privatization uh, will require 100 and 100 million dollars to be paid to the state. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we will compare with concession, for example, Olvia, for 49 years, state fixed annual concession fee at, uh, and uh, further operator, in case of concession of Olvia, it's a uh, queue terminal from Qatar, will pay annual fee during further 49 years. The same in Kherson. Uh, we think that it is more comfortable for investor to divide this payment for 49 years. And at the same time, it's very close to privatization if we are talking about external credit, ex external uh, financing, because investor will receive, concessionaire will receive to balance this activity. Also, the rent or lease can, can be used for the objects which not require a huge investment. So in case we have some terminal which uh, just need operator, not uh, uh, financial investment, some professional management, we can also propose for the lease form and trying to find the um, operator on uh, like a um, professional, national or, or worldwide stevedore company. Uh, according to our plans for the next uh, three years, only one state stevedoring company should be operated by the state, Port of Yuzhny, 
all other TV during companies should be uh, moved to the private public partnership. <coughs> uh, strategical infrastructure will be responsibility of the state bodies, but uh, we also see that uh, see that uh, bursaries, for example, which now are prohibited for privatization, can be moved to privatization as well. Because uh, again, talking about three pilot projects for privatization, in case of success, tender and new uh, buyer, uh, the key lines versus will, uh, uh, is not included to the list. So it can be rent again uh, or taken concession, but we think that it's possible also to privatize the key lines as well because uh, it's uh, more uh, uh, efficient for the further operator um, and uh, what is the reason to keep it, for example, in Skadovsk, the state balance in case of all hinterland will be privatized, privatized. and we will support uh, the change to the uh, government, to the law, uh, in order to uh, permit such privatization for the future. <coughs> uh, Regarding state infrastructure, mm, for all state infrastructure, dredging channels responsible uh, Ukrainian support authority, 100% state enterprise, under corporatization, by the, by the way. Uh, the source of incomes, uh, port dues, which pay every vessel which comes to the Ukrainian ports. Unfortunately, we uh, have, uh, presently in Ukraine, we have not, no efficient dividends policy, because from this 100% percent of incomes of uh, USPA, more than 90 percent uh, transferred to the state budget like a dividend. And uh, uh, our position, and we are trying to change uh, the decision of the government and maybe even the law, uh, to uh, decrease it up to 30 percent, so 30 percent to the state budget, 70 percent to the uh, investments and renovation. In this case, it will be enough, enough funds to uh, not only to support the debts, uh, to reconstruct it, to make our harbors uh, uh, more debt, more uh, to, in order to you know to to be ready when the Istanbul Channel will be constructed, because we already uh, should think about uh, this huge infrastructure project for the whole Black Sea and uh, Ukraine present has a chance to be the leader, to be the more deepest, uh, deepest ports in the future, but of course we need money. According to our uh, forecast, around um, 17 billion grivnos needs to be invested to the strategical port assets within next five years. Well, at, uh, I talk about seaports. Uh, other story, uh, internal waterways. As we know, since 1st of January, new, uh, January next year, uh, the new law about internal waterways started to work. Uh, we hope that uh, up to the end of this year, the parliament will uh, prove the project of the law about special fund of the uh, internal waterways support, and we can also invest uh, to the Dnieper River, to other uh, Ukrainian rivers, uh, to the locks reconstruction, because it's very serious infrastructure objects at the Dnieper River. And uh, it will be another story and another uh, direction of the investments uh, in Ukraine for private business as well. And the story there is the inland waterways are underused now. It's used, but it's used now 15% um, from the potential. 15% 15 15, of, of potential. 15. And the reason why increasing that is important is because it takes the pressure off the rails and the roads, and it's cheaper? Uh, it's greener. Greener. Can be greener. The internal waterways were and still are not com enough competitive in comparison with the rail and with the uh, trucks. It is a complex question. And the uh, Minister of Infrastructure, together with the Cabinet of Ministry, with the government, already solved some issues, like uh, uh, weight, like weight in motion system, by the way, started from the 1st of October, new reform, and new penalties, and uh, automatic control, etc. Uh, 
again, a law about internal water waterways cancelled all the charges from the uh, ship owners and charters on the river. So since 1st of January, it will not, not be necessary to pay for the locks, not necessary to pay for the bridge opens, and it will be not necessary to pay port dues for the channel in case of the depth of the vessel um, not uh, uh, more than 4.5 meters, etc. So the government, government uh, made the uh, internal waterways cheaper at the same time started to be most uh, uh, used most strict control at the, uh, the trucks roads, yeah. and and the roads and uh, increase the tariffs and the uh, railway as well okay so we, we see that some balance will uh, appear so you're making progress yeah regarding other uh, directions uh, great reconstru great construction it's well known program for everybody uh, special road fund around uh, 24 uh, thousand kilometers of the main roads to be constructed till uh, 2025. Uh, Ten uh, airports should be renovated. Around 1,400 new bridges uh, or uh, reconstruction of the existing one. Uh, three city express, high speed uh, Kiev, Warsaw, and other uh, steps, and uh, all of them under the already under implementation. So it's not like a, you know a project and strategy in the paper. It's the real things with uh, most of them already um, under realization. A railway, it's another story. It, it's a long story. Long and sto a and long story, but kind of a sad story. Too. Yeah, but again, we hope that from the sad story started to be uh, positive. All right. the nearest is the nearest future. Let's yeah. shift to the worldly man from the World Bank. <laughs> hmm. Well, maybe we should talk about the world. I want to actually pick up on the point made earlier about the strategy for investment will have to depend on what place Ukraine has in the world, right? And especially with Europe. This is, from our side, we see this really as the eventual source of uh, Ukraine's growth, is to connect to these markets, these huge markets, uh, to the west of uh, Ukraine. And that's where the infrastructure challenges also can be inhibiting it. So think about a few very positive things that have happened and can occur. The land reform, right? The land reform is not a reform for its own sake. It is to have agricultural revival in Ukraine and to increase productivity and to allow farmers to grow more, better, be more productive. Where's that grain going to go, the increased production going to be? Is the logistics that are required going to be sufficient for that? Just thinking of the logistics, in, in the World Bank has all these indices, uh, and one of them is the Logistics Performance Index. And the Logistics Performing Index puts Ukraine at um, 69th in the world, um, behind countries like uh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, behind Burkina Faso, behind Nigeria, and Ukraine, um, performs worst in the infrastructure component of the uh, logistics performance index. But in that, you also see the potential for change. And I really want to applaud the government for passing some of these laws um, that have moved towards addressing some of these. Certainly the inland waterways law, the concessions law. Coming up, we hope the railways law, uh, which has uh, been um, approved in the first reading and now um, should be approved in the second reading. Very importantly, what that would do is at least financially separate the operation of the railways, unbundle if you'd like. Right. So the infrastructure part of the railways, the lines and all of that, will be separated from the operators for freight and passenger. And what that would make transparent, by the way, this is important for, uh, by the EU, um, uh, a key because eventually this uh, railway system will have to uh, be consistent with mm. the Europeans. And doing that will make, if you'd like, the cross-subsidies transparent and therefore also allow the investments that the railways need to make in order to be uh, more efficient and more, um, more play a much more central function in this. Right now, you know, the transportation by railways uh, contribute about 4% of Ukraine G Ukraine's GDP. Um, and again, railways 
including because the Green Deal will have the future, uh, will be the future of logistics if it happens. But logistics is also multimodal, right? So everything we've been talking about actually fits together. Somehow the conversation's always been, oh, there's railways, there's ports, there's roads. Mm -hmm. But actually the way logistics systems work is that all of these connect to each other, the, especially in the container trade, but more generally as well. So you will have to have railways carry the grain, if you'd like, to the ports. There may be a last mile, which may be rail or road, the containers will have to be able to be moved uh, cheaply and efficiently into the ships. Deep water ports may be uh, a solution to that using the Istanbul Channel. So the blueprint, if you'd like, uh, at the high level is there. But what um, these, there are many steps that are required to, to get there. Uh, first, to f actually build each of these different pieces but much more importantly, to also have a vision of how to connect them together in order to actually build that logistics chain um, that will allow Ukraine to meet its potential for exports and growth. And that's, I think, something that, um, going back to planning, um, not Soviet type of planning, but strategic planning, um, it is really important that um, the government actually thinks in these 15, 20 year horizons, because investments in infrastructure will take that sort of time. Mm -hmm. So what is it that we want to get to? If it is about the export market, if it is about the connectivity with Europe, and also by the way, not trivially connectivity within Ukraine, mm -hmm. to connect the east of Ukraine better to the central part of Ukraine, which uh, is something, for example, the World Bank has been involved in, then beyond just building the roads, um, beyond just improving the railways, how do we connect all of these to get the economic impact that is needed? And that, I think, is the bigger challenge. Um, and if that is addressed, then all of these pieces, the laws, the investments, etc., fit together, and private investors will see that vision and come in. And that's, I think, what uh, I hope that Ukraine could embark on right now. The vision's there, right, Yuri? Absolutely agree, and I would like also to draw the attention that what is the, uh, what is the target of development of the port? Not to uh, increase the profit of the port, uh, but in order to uh, improve international trade. Except development of railway, roads, and ports, we also need to make our legislation which regulates international trade more transparent, more simple. Because I think for the moment, 20-25% of the bottleneck it is not infrastructure, procedures. In this connection, all, we also need to change, to modernize legislation to the European Union standards. Mm -hmm. Simple, transparent rules. About everything everything mm -hmm. to, sorry, everything to the IT. Okay. But about the railway network, is that Similar to what, I mean, the electricity grid in terms of we have to change, we have to completely change the, the railway network to integrate with the European, no? No. Uh -huh. Essentially, I mean, there is a technical challenge that the gauge of the Ukrainian railways is different from uh, the European uh, standard, but that can be overcome. The main thing is actually to be able to revitalize the investment in railways. So, the numbers, again numbers, uh, 9,000 kilometers of rail need to be refurbished in Ukraine. Per year, right now, under the complex challenges that Ukraine and face, they'll be able to do less than 1,000, maybe 500 uh, a year. And that is a huge um, burden to, uh, to have. Therefore, again, the rail, what the railways law can do is to begin getting Ukrasilintsia out of the financial mess, make the uh, internal subsidies, cross subsidies, much more transparent. The Ministry of Infrastructure actually has taken a very, very important step in increasing freight tariffs um, 
that the first has already happened, a small one, and then... Thank God. Yeah, but it's, it's long overdue. But I, again, this is, again, it is important that the political impetus remains and continues because then that will create the financial space for the railways to move towards that. The unbundling will also go to where Taras was talking about, that the Ukrainian also has a huge amount of unproductive assets that are sort of hidden in, in this financial labyrinth. To make those transparent, those can be spun off and therefore costs also reduced and made more efficient. So the railways reform, something that the World Bank is uh, looking forward to supporting very strongly, um, is something that I think is a critical part of Ukraine's uh, future in infrastructure and in transport infrastructure, again, because of the location, right? So this is where air is not going to be the major means of getting the economic boost mm -hmm. that you need. Railways, which is a greener form of transport compared to roads and trucks, and Ukraine already has one of the largest networks in the world. Um, this is the way that uh, Ukraine can actually grow. As I understand it, you're exactly right. Uh, I believe we have 20,000 kilometers of rail, rail lines in this country, and it connects to like 90% of the cities, almost. Absolutely. So we have this network here, but, and the, my guests may disagree, as I understand it, it's not so complicated. We have, uh, the tariffs have been way low on metallurgy and grain, running the railways essentially into the ground. We have no high-speed trains, so we get from one, we, can, we get from point A to point B but very slowly, not good when you're talking infrastructure, and you talked about why are we doing this. It's efficient, speedy, efficient movement of people and goods. That's infrastructure, uh, I guess, in a nutshell. World Bank's willing to go big on this? Yes. Maybe construct, reconstruct all 20,000 well, we kilometers of rail? We don't <laughs> reconstruct. The government will, but we are happy to partner with them. Um, because I think that, to us, that seems to be um, one of the ways. If we're, again, in, interested in growth for Ukraine, for prosperity for Ukraine's people, this is one of the ways. Because we can't have the farmers improve their crops and grow new and high pro productivity uh, you know, change their crop mixes, looking towards the market, and then the logistics stops this from happening. Exactly. Um, that's a good point. And I, it's well taken about the priorities. I, just, I mean, I come from America, a, a city that dismantled its public transportation, tram lines, at the behest mm -hmm. of the automobile industry in the right. 50s. And what do we see now? We see a renewal of, well, it's now called light rail, rail mm -hmm. high-speed rail lines. So we've uh, gone, uh, we took the priority, the car was the priority, and now, now we've decided in the world the cars shouldn't be the priority. But also, point very well taken, Brian, but Ukraine actually, again, I want to look at the half full the glass right or side. the three-quarter full glass, Ukraine's reforms happening now and the investments happening now can actually leapfrog in technology. Ukraine actually, look at the bright side, Ukraine is still one of the leaders in the region in digital technology, right? Smart being the word of the day. Right. Um, there are systems, um, including for railways, for uh, airports, as you talked about, uh, even for roads that can actually leapfrog the old technology and Cut, cut away some of the middlemen and uh, opportunities for corruption and actually improve efficiency a lot. Um, one of the things that we haven't talked about a lot is, of course, roads, which right. is interesting because roads are the, um, the headline of the day. A um, couple of observations there that may be useful. Um, first, um, the sad part. Um, building roads in Ukraine is fantastic, but Ukraine has also some of the highest road fatalities in Europe. Right. This is so you build more roads, um, more people die uh, if the roads are not built right. So a big part, and again, I'm very uh, pleased that the Ministry of Infrastructure is really taking a big uh, interest in this, is to actually build these new roads more safely. So we'll do a sort of pilot exercise that sets out the model. Uh, well, we'll help the government do a pilot exercise that will 
uh, set out some of the road safety areas. Um, and hopefully that will be um, rolled out across Ukraine. So when the roads are built, to coin a phrase, they'll be built back better, if you'd like, um, in a way that lessens the fatalities and the accidents that happen uh, in, in roads in Ukraine. So just building roads, again, purely building roads, where cars can go fast, is a very mixed blessing. In okay. Ukraine. I get, and the numbers sound terrific. 24,000 kilometers of roads rebuilt until you look at, as I understand it, we have 170,000 kilometers of roads in Ukraine. So this isn't even, what it is, it's 10, 15 percent, even with this big construction program. So there's a lot to do. And maybe now is a good time to get back to the conversation that Dimitro raised about the problems and how to overcome them. You, you mentioned that without naming the problems. And if you can go into that, that would be great. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, except the, the regulatory regime, the, the whole invest, uh, investment climate, what we call investment climate, uh, I would uh, also mention that uh, it is uh, um, very important to get access to affordable financing, right? Because uh, uh, we, we understand that uh, not only Ukrainian banks, for instance, but uh, the international banks full of liquidity, right? And uh, money, um, money is seeking uh, good projects. Uh, uh, however, uh, in terms of the uh, Ukrainian banks, uh, it's, uh, it's not only the, you know, the, the, the interest rate, but uh, uh, the whole transaction structure when the commercial bank is, is obliged to, uh, you know, to require uh, collaterals uh, uh, and uh, all the incumbencies, uh, you know, that uh, you should provide to, to take the, that financing, uh, which uh, in many cases uh, stop uh, realization of the projects, yeah? So, uh, in other words, we need project financing, right? Uh, which is impossible now, unfortunately, yeah? From the private banks. Uh, yeah, from the private banks. So we need access to get access to, to uh, I, uh, I don't want to say cheap financing because uh, it's always market. So the cost of capital is, is always a market issue. So. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, again, uh, it's, it's, it's not an issue uh, of how big or less the interest rate. It's the overall uh, mm, terms and conditions upon which the commercial banks, commercial institution is ready to provide financing, right? So this is uh, 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 especially talking about the, the, uh, the infrastructure, the projects uh, which normally require uh, huge financing, right? So it's, uh, uh, it's uh, one of the red flags, yeah? uh, one of the barriers uh, from that side. So uh, uh, wh uh, what else? Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, of course, the rule of law, of course, uh, transparent uh, uh, rules uh, uh, on the market, uh, judicial system. Uh, so we, um, we all know these problems uh, we, we, uh, we, we discuss uh, uh, on, 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 different, uh, 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 on different events that uh, uh, Ukraine uh, needs more uh, predictable uh, investment climate. Yeah? Regardless of the political situation, Regardless, uh, uh, of course, we 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 dependent on the what, what's happening in the world. We we are heavily dependent country on the on the global trends, etc. However, our homework is to do our best here, in order to uh, inspire, encourage private capital to invest, and the the horizon of that investment should be much longer, right? Because uh, uh, now we're thinking about one, two, three year time. 
but in terms of the infrastructure projects, uh, it, it, it could be much longer. Uh, it should be decades, 10, 20 years. Yeah, what uh, uh, we, uh, we um, again, we, uh, we move to, to a higher level uh, of our vision. Yeah, what uh, country we see in 20 years time, for instance, right? Mm -hmm. What should be the infrastructure? Uh, how um, uh, how it will um, you know meet the requirements of sustainability, the requirements of uh, uh, gradual growth uh, of the uh, not only the economy but uh, the society as well, right? So that uh, this is uh, um, uh, the main issue and the the main problem uh, w how to coordinate the the current problems with with that vision that we have in the future. Uh, so uh, I think that um, uh, uh, with the assistance of our partners like uh, World Bank, uh, uh, so we uh, I hope that we will we will be able to all overcome these uh, these barriers. Um, uh, I think that we need uh, more uh, more discussions uh, on the on the level uh, between uh, between the state and private businesses, right? How to establish, first of all, the trust, yeah, between the state and, uh, and the businesses. How to establish uh, uh, sustainable relations, yeah? So, uh, because we, uh, as private business, we uh, calculate, we always calculate uh, our projects. Right, uh, uh, business models, financial models, and uh, if uh, uh, if uh, uh, we were sure that, uh, for instance, the green tariff is in place, yeah. So we we built all our strategies on the, on that fact, right? And then if if the if, if the rules uh, have been changed, so we are in a difficult situation, right? And it is difficult uh, to us to articulate. To external world that guys please uh, invest into Ukraine yeah because uh, uh, international players they always look uh, uh, at the uh, how the uh, how the state uh, you know fulfill their obligations investment obligations this is a key fundamental for the for the investment climate uh, so but again um, uh, tactical um, tactical prob uh, problems is uh, first of all it's um, access to to financing yeah for for these big projects Private investors, do you I mean the international financial institutions World Bank EBRD yeah. IFC and even international government it's like uh, European Union have been known to tread where private investors fear to tread. Do private investors feel better if the World Bank or EBRD is involved in a project, feel more protected? Uh, uh, yes, uh, of course. Uh, it is um, uh, normally um, we, we feel much comfortable, yeah, because we, we understand that there is uh, a reliable partner, yeah, w uh, with, uh, with a le leverage not only financial lever leverage but reputational leverage uh, and everything yeah so uh it's uh, it's much easier to uh, uh attract financing from co-investors right if you do uh, the project with uh, w with the assistance of the world bank or ebrd or or ifc uh so um it, it, of course uh uh, it would be uh, much appreciated if the international institutions pay more attention to Ukrainian uh, economy uh, and specifically in the area of ins infrastructure because we all understand that this is the, the key uh, keystone uh, uh, how to move uh, rapidly the Ukrainian economy on the, on the upper level. Okay. Yeah. Looks like you have a long-term role, Dr. Bonner. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely, and I think that's one of the things that I, I hope that uh, all international partners, as you said, can, can help. Because eventually, you know, we have a group of people here, but they represent uh, a lot uh, of others behind them who really are thinking about the future of Ukraine, whether from the public side uh, or the private sector side. The challenge is that, 
reputations um, are easily destroyed and slow to build. And so what international partners can do is provide some of that um, reassurance. By the way, we talked about the two port concessions, right? So IFC, for example, had a, a role in helping with that. And that really, I think, was helpful in bringing in the investors. Similarly, um, we're talking about uh, concessions. Uh, we're working with the Ministry of Infrastructure, for example, to get a model for road PPPs and concessions, right? So those are areas where we hope that um, organizations like us getting involved can lower some of the perceived risks, maybe some of the actual risks, and help bring in the capital that's needed. Okay, that would be great. We're gone a little past an hour. Uh, it's been a great discussion. Probably should bring it to a close. And I will start, but I'll ask you all the same question. Whatever horizon you want, 10, 20 years, what, you know, we, we see this city model planning. What in your fantasies would be the ideal infrastructure and what, what economic uh, effect would that be? and how to get there. I mean, I personally would like to get from one side of Ukraine to another in a high speed train within a couple hours from any major city uh, or by a regional airport for, you know, a affordable air flight. I would like to see the, the inland waterways and the ports used to their full capacity as Ukraine keeps uh, record after record breaking grain harvest and, and, and so forth. I would like to see it all be green. I would like to see the, you know, uh, the renovation of the roads, but also reinvestment in public transport because it's still the most effective and I think green way to get people around. I'm a little, I think if Ukraine does all this, maybe we can triple, quadruple, get to a trillion dollars in, in gross domestic product. So that's just a dream and fantasy. I'm a little short on how to get there, but maybe you guys can do that. Maybe we'll go in reverse order. Yuri, your, sketch out what your vision would be for the next 10 years. In, in, case, in case we will be uh, in the first tense of the logistics rating, it will be a good <laughs> result. Rating, move, improve that log logistics. And, yeah, and to be in first tense. Okay. First. First 10, that would be great. And we're now 69th, okay? It will be great for everybody. <laughs> you have your work cut out for you. Okay. I hope you plan to stay there a long time. <laughs> Ten years, yeah. like you said. Right. Well, uh, my vision is that um, in terms, uh, for instance, uh, uh, of aviation industry, that Ukraine is part of the open sky. So we, c we could easily uh, travel from Kyiv to any other city in the world. Um, and especially Europe, our, our uh, nearest uh, uh, neighbor, I would say. Uh, of course, uh, mm, the infrastructure should meet the, the needs uh, of, the, of the economy and development of the society and uh, uh, support all these, uh, uh, all these needs. Uh, so we, uh, we for, uh, for instance, we see how uh, rapidly develop, uh, developing um, the, the uh, e-commerce, right? So we need uh, the logistic infrastructure for that. Uh, the, not only the warehouses for storage, but warehouses for fulfillment, for processing the small uh, orders and everything to rapidly uh, develop the, the uh, uh, d deliver the products to the, to the final, to the customers, right? So uh, I think that uh, uh, Ukraine have uh, all the chances uh, to be in line with uh, the world trends and, and tendencies. So uh, the, the only problem, uh, we need both pr uh, public and pri uh, private uh, 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 cooperation uh, and uh, focus, vision and focus on what we're doing. And uh, we, we will achieve uh, our, um, our goals. Okay, Taras? Um, I believe that we will succeed, really succeed, uh, because we have a very interesting positions. As of now, we are the, po the country in the Europe, I believe one of uh, two or three countries that still have, you know, uh, initial market of state property. 
great investment opportunities because when we are talking about uh, Western Europe, we are talking about IRRs like, I don't know, three, four percent. Mm -hmm. In Ukraine, we are talking about 10, 15, 20 percent IRRs. Definitely, they will be falling, but still, there are lots of investment opportunities. And if the country will uh, support all these investments, will support the rule of law and become more regulators than the player on the investment field, I believe that in 10 years we will see a totally different country with lots of private, uh, you know, infrastructure objects, with lots of investments that are really needed to move forward th this development. So I'm very optimistic in this way. I hope you don't mind if I put you on the spot, but should we have a national state-owned airline? Uh, I think that the most efficient model in this way uh, sometimes for the state it's important to have uh, national operators, for example, but it should be not 100% uh, state-owned because always the private investor is like, anyway, is more efficient, is more goal-oriented. So PPP model, I believe, is, uh, can work in this way. Okay, that's good. So we're going to end with a man from Calcutta. So um, my vision for Ukraine is not to become like my city, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, but more seriously. Um, really, I think there are two sort of archetype people that I think about, and uh, you're one of them, uh, Brian, in terms of a citizen of Ukraine who actually can, without much thinking, say that I want to go from here to Odessa and I have my choice of good transportation, whether by road, whether by um, high-speed rail, whether by uh, a good flight from a cheap carrier with a competitive market. I think that feels like you are a um, citizen of a country that uh, is going places. And I think that feeling is important and that is behind a lot of the impetus going forward. But I also think about a small farmer in central uh, Ukraine who has been struggling, who is not part of this elite group who may be able to do that, and whether they can actually change their, their product, own their own piece of land, get better financing from banks, and then have the logistical opportunities to actually export and grow and pass on a legacy to their community and their families. That's really the vision in 10 years that I would like to see. And let's hope the World Bank is there. I can't thank this group enough for taking a very broad, very complicated topic and, and making it understandable what the, what the goals are, not only what the goals are, but how to get there. So I want to thank you. I guess our time's up. We can have many discussions about this. I hope we'll come back and maybe we'll focus on one of the segments of infrastructure or and, and drill down more deeply. But I want to, I guess we, we should go now, but I want to thank Dimitri Martinenko of Quarter Partners for making this happen. Good luck with your investments. Hope you get a big return on investment <laughs> on everything you do, the Midas touch. And that's it. Brian Bonner, Chief Editor of the Keep Post, signing off for now, but join us. Uh, stay tuned for our next Keep Post webinars. Have a good day.